Hello, this is Clint Halstead, and this is a lecture on using uh, Tim Wilmshire's Design Embedded uh, Systems with PIC Microcontrollers for Introduction to Microprocessors, or Introduction to Microcontrollers course. Um, this is going to cover Chapter 1, Sections 4 through 6. So this is a continuation of a video that I posted before. Okay, so... Section 1.4 is starts off with microprocessors and microcontrollers. Uh, <coughs> a microcontroller is a microprocessor designed primarily to perform simple control functions. Uh, microcontrollers usually have the following features, which are low cost, which, by the way, is different than microprocessors. You know, microprocessors. Uh, opinion processor, for example, may cost 40, 50, 60 bucks or more, and they're very large, require big heat sinks. Microcontrollers, on the other hand, are low cost, uh, physically small, they have an input output intensive and capability of easily interfacing with the outside world. Where an uh, opinion processor, for example, would be you know, harder to interface with the outside world, mostly interfacing with. Uh, RAM and memory and things on a board, not so much uh, into the outside world. Um, <clears throat> so, a pinion processor may interface with a, a south bridge, other chips that would go to the outside world, but not directly to the outside world. Whereas a microcontroller would go directly to the outside world. <clears throat> um, also, a microcontroller is going to have a limited memory capability for program and data. So, you know, like a processor, pinion processor or AMD processor is going to have external memory. So you, you would buy memory, it, of course it may have, it'll have cache, uh, but it won't have uh, any non-volatile memory, it won't have any large amounts of memory, so typically that those are added externally to the microprocessor. But a microcontroller, on the other hand, is going to have onboard memory and uh, vote both volatile and non-volatile memory built inside the processor itself so there's no need for external added memory so uh, microcontroller is is really an independent it's it's all you need basically it's there's no there's no more digital external things you would typically would have to add uh, unless you wanted additional features above and beyond what the microcontroller could provide but for the most part uh, all your memory and data uh, capabilities are included into the microcontroller. Also, the instruction set leading to a compact code with limited arithmetic capability. So, <coughs> this is this is really what we call the risk architecture or reduced instruction set. Um, so you have a limited amount of instruction uh, instructions for the microcontroller. And you know you, you may have some chips don't have multiplier divide some some just have addition and subtraction some chips have uh, multiplication but not division so that's that's what it means by limited arithmetic capability <coughs> and then ability to operate in a real time environment so that means that that you can process data as it's happening. <coughs> Also, for certain other applications, you want to be able to operate in a hostile environment, like an industrial environment, higher or low temperature. Whereas in a PC with a PM processor, AMD processor, you have a, a room temperature is typically what you have, and you have a, a nice big fan and heat sinking and all that, where you wouldn't have that uh, with a microcontroller. You wouldn't really need the heat sink and all that um, added hardware, which adds a lot of cost and expense. Also, for a microcontroller, you want to have low, low power. So, a pinion processor may consume 120 amps, but a microcontroller may consume, you know, 50 microamps or 10 milli milliamps, a very, very low amount of current and power. <coughs> so, the features of a general pur purpose controller now, there's lots of different microcontrollers on the market and by lots of different manufacturers 
different families and things like that. But uh, <clears throat> one thing that you're going to find is they're all going to have some similarities. And at the core of them, they're going to have the microprocessor core. And you can see that here. Um, <clears throat> and so how does this co contrast with a microprocessor? Uh, so a microcontroller has a microprocessor in it. That's one way to think about it. So a microcontroller has a microprocessor in it. So when you talk about a, just a microprocessor alone, like the Pentium microprocessor, uh, it's just a standalone unit. Whereas a microcontroller would have that inside inside of a microcontroller plus other things. And we'll talk about the other things. So at the core is the microprocessor. Then you have the data memory. You have some program memory built inside of the chip. You have some other peripherals. You have some digital I.O., some counters, uh, and things like that. So a microcontroller is a microprocessor plus memory plus peripherals. Okay. And then externally here you have to provide a clock. You're going to have a reset pin always and you're going to always have power that you need to provide. So really um, a microcontroller is really easy to set up. As long as you have a clock, a reset, and then power, it's pretty happy. There's not a whole lot of other things you're going to have to provide for it. Whereas a microprocessor, there's a whole slew of things you're going to have to provide for that in addition to these things. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> there's this term in the book talked about on page uh, 13, which is talking about microcontroller families. Uh, there are thousands of different microcontroller types in the world made by numerous different manufacturers, all reflect in one way or another the block diagram here. And the manufacturer builds a microcontroller family around a fixed microprocessor core. So we can see for this family one, you may have a fixed core. So that's the processor uh, core. Um, and the different family members are created by using the same core, included, including with different combinations of peripherals and different sizes of memory. So we're going to be talking about these family of microprocessors. And we'll talk about that on, the, on some of the next slides. But the way it works is you take a certain core uh, processor silicon and then you add different sizes of memories and even though each one of these is going to be a different chip with a different part number these four devices would be four different chips with four different part numbers but they would be considered into the same family because it would have at, at the core of that family would be the same core processor and, and what we mean by that having the same core processor What's implied by that statement is that the instructions are going to be exactly the same. So you're going to use the exact same instruction set. Or in other words, you're using the same uh, code when you do your software programming. <clears throat> okay. Now if you jump to another family, your core is going to change. You may, your instruction set may change. So you may increase the size of your instruction set and you may have different uh, features. Now over here, this baseline family may not have a multiply instruction. Maybe it just has adding and subtracting. But when you jump to this family that has this type of core, mid-range core, then all of a sudden it adds uh, up to 77 instructions and then the multiply uh, instruction and many, many other instructions. So again, you would have, <coughs> this is just an example, you, in this family, you, in this example, you're, you're showing four chips that have different part numbers but they're all the same family because they have the same core okay you may have 10 or 12 or 15 different different configurations using the same core maybe all having different sizes of memory and different amount of peripherals and by peripherals we mean uh, something like analog to digital converter um, some analog I.O. some counters, timers things like that. Different types of serial interface buses, CAN bus, uh, UARTs, uh, RS-232, things like that. So <clears throat> so that's what we, we mean by the word family and that's something that's very important on page 13 in the text to learn what what do we mean by the word family. Okay, And that means that every, everything in the, in the common family is going to have a common core. And then of course when you jump to the Family three, you have even a more advanced core, maybe faster, maybe add some interrupt features, things like that. 
Okay, so the different parts in, so we talked about having different uh, part numbers. We had talked about having different manufacturers and each manufacturer having different parts inside of their, their core. So two of the popular ones years ago were Motorola. I, I guess Motorola is still somewhat popular. What's not shown on here, which is extremely popular these days, is an ARM microprocessor, like an ARM Cortex. In fact, 98% of, of all cell phones have at least one ARM core processor. PIC microcontrollers are extremely popular for hobbyists and embedded systems um, and for just uh, freeware and open source code and just many, many different areas. You see PIC microcontrollers, extremely popular. They have really good uh, support website, very cheap parts, you know, parts like 40 cents, 50 cents, on up to you know, ten dollars, twenty dollars, so or maybe not twenty, but ten. But um, and then also you have uh, Acatel, uh, various other companies that make make chips. But we're going to focus on the PIC or the microchip. So the microchip uh, company calls their parts by the the acronym PIC, P-I-C. So if if it says PIC in the part number, you know it comes from a company called Microchip. And that's where we're going to find all of our data sheets and things like that. www.microchip.com. You can download the free software, install it on your computer, <clears throat> you can buy development boards and things like that. You can also see here, not only we have Motorola uh, and then microchips parts, we also see uh, different package types. So even within the same family you may have a PIC 16F84A that has a DIP package as shown and this same part may come in a SOP package or a surface mount package and various other packages so one cool thing about microchip is they make all of their processors in DIP packages the DIP packages are these very large packages that look like this that have the the leads on them that will fit into a standard solderless breadboard so that you can prototype them and then once you prototype them, if you want to put it on a surface mount board, well, you simply purchase the same part number, but with a different package. Okay? So this part could come in a different package, a smaller package. Uh, <clears throat> this one particular chip, you can see how small it is in, in reference to a quarter. So size is very important. <clears throat> Here's some history that I'm not going to read. You can read it on your own. You can click the pause button and read this, but just talks about the PIC was originally designed a design of the company called General Instruments and kind of talks about the history of that and it was sold off and then despite the huge advances it still uh, keeps the uh, the features of the original company and has been very successful in doing what they do again they're not in competition with Intel or AMD to create processors they're in the microcontroller business they're trying to control things so they're their deal is to be small, cheap, and to have a, a niche in that in that market. <coughs> Next thing we can see here is um, in your textbook on page 17. Here's the chart of the different families. Now, first thing you notice here, you have the family uh, column. You have a baseline, mid-range, and then you have the high performance. <coughs> Now the baseline, you notice you're going to have example devices. Notice that you can't really go off the... The first number you have is a 10, and then an F, and then a 200. The, the 10, you would think, well, all the baseline parts should have a 10. Well, you have a 12 here and you have a 16. And then down in the mid-range, you have a 12 and a 16. They kind of overlap a little bit. So uh, you'll find that to be true. So you can't really tell always whether it's a mid-range part by just the first two numbers. Sometimes you have to look at the data sheet. What they're defining here as being a baseline part is as a part that has a instruction word of 12 bits. Okay? What they're defining as mid-range is going to be a part that has instruction size of 14 bits. And for a high high performance part, it's going to be one that has 16 bits. And, and just remember, this is just for microchip. This is just for one company of microcontrollers on the market. There's various others. There's Motorola, there's ARM, there's, uh, uh, there's you know, 
there's uh, AMD, or well not AMD, but there's many other companies that make processors as well. And uh, so they're all going to have different ways that they define their baseline, mid-range, and high performance. So just this only applies to uh, microchip. So for the microchip line processor, which we're going to use in this class, um, it's defined by the instruction word size. Okay. Now notice that in the baseline parts, you have only 33 instructions. That means that there's only 33 different code words or commands in assembly language, that is, or hardware language, that is going to control this chip. Only 33 instructions. There's no interrupt ve vectors in a baseline part. So that's kind of the definition or how they've defined it. Now, they're defining a mid-range part as one that has 35 instructions, 14-bit um, instruction size, and then one interrupt vector. And you can see here some example devices as well. Then when you jump to the high performance, their high performance parts, you jump up to 75 instructions. Um, also, the high performance parts are used in the, for C language mostly coding. They're kind of targeted for, towards the C language. Um, and they're going to have two interrupt vectors. They're going to have a stack size of 32 words and then instruction word size of 16 bits. So that's the way they've defined it and they've given you some examples here. <coughs> okay. So that's important to kind of become familiar with that chart. Um, here's an example part. This part is a 12508. So this is a baseline part. You can see here that it has eight pins. So it's small. You can see that it has a VDD. That's for plus 5 volts. VSS is for ground. You're going to see here that it has some multifunction pins. When you see these, these names with the slashes in it, it means it's a multifunction. GP5 means general purpose pin 5. Or it can also be an oscillator pin. Or it can also be a clock in. Oscillator, so these two oscillator pins means you put a crystal between these two pins if you want to have an external oscillator crystal that is. If you want to provide an external TTL clock signal, not an oscillator chip, but an actual signal that comes from another supply or something, you can provide it just on pin 2. Or you can use this pin as a general purpose pin if the chip inside of it has an oscillator that's built in that doesn't need a crystal or something like that. You never do know unless you look at the data sheet. So the only way to really know what you need on these external pins is to um, look at the data sheet. Also on this, so, so pin 4, we talked about pin 1, 2, and 3. Pin 4, it can be a general purpose pin. That's a general purpose I.O. That's either you know input or output. You can configure it as input or output. Or you can use this as a reset signal. That's called the master clear, which is active low. Active low means that it will be active when it's low. So the chip will be cleared when it's low. So if you're having a problem with your chip, it's not working, and you can't get it to do anything, maybe it's because this this reset pin is low. If it's low, the chip won't do anything. When it goes high, it releases the pin and allows it to go ahead and work and to, in to execute instructions. Moving on to pin 4, we have a general purpose pin, so it can be configured as a general purpose input digital or output digital. Also, it can be a, an input clock. Okay. Uh, then we move on to pin 6, which can be also a general purpose pin, input or output. But notice that 6 and 7 you have in-circuit serial programming. That's what ICSP stands for, data and clock. So this allows you to program with the header your, your internal memory data. That's what we talked about ha the chips having internal memory, non-volatile and volatile memory, like flash on your key fob. So you can uh, move data from your MP lab program on your PC to your microprocessor chip. Okay, so that's where the, the program will reside. It has to have some way of getting the data inside the chip, and that's, these are the two pins it uses. And again, VSS is ground, so that's pin 8. And this describes everything that we just talked about. Now finally, we're going to go over the block diagram. Now this is a little overwhelming, I know, and you don't, I'm not expecting you to become an expert instantly on this, but I do want to go over this briefly, and we're going to talk about everything in more detail as we go through the class, okay? We'll talk about each one of these blocks in more detail, or most of them at least in more detail. Um, but this is just an overview right now. So let's start with this diagram. We come with the CPU. The CPU is the heart of the microcontroller. 
It has a uh, arithmetic logic unit, the ALU is the heart of that even. Uh, we have a working register, which is the output of the ALU. So the ALU can perform like, for example, addition or subtraction. So let's just give an example. It has two inputs, okay? The two inputs represent two words or two digital values, maybe eight and maybe nine. Maybe it's going to add those two together and it's going to give you 17. So eight and nine give you 17. Um, and then that's, that's how it works. So we have, this could also operate as a subtraction to give you uh, nine minus eight would give you one. Or it could get to an AND function. So that's the way arithmetic logic unit works. It has some inputs, has some outputs. Um, next thing we look at is it has the data memory up here. Uh, it's called file registers, but it's also RAM, random access memory. Notice it has a data bus to it and an address bus to it. Notice there's only 25 locations on this particular chip. Okay, so that's not a whole lot, but that's the way that some of the chips are. They don't have a whole lot of RAM. Notice that this is going to be a Harvard architecture, and since it's a Harvard architecture, it means it's going to have two address buses. Uh, you're going to have one for data, one for one for program memory, one one for data memory. So. This is the data memory, this is the program memory. So the flash or the non-volatile is your program memory. Here it says you have 512 times, 512 times 12. And your RAM, which is your volatile memory, you're going to have only 25. Okay? <coughs> and again, the way this flash is programmed is with those two pins we call the in, serial, uh, in, in circuit serial programming data in circuit serial programming clock. So those pins will program your flash. <clears throat> okay, so notice that the um, the program the program memory has the address for the pro for the program memory is a program counter. So the program counter has 12 bits. This little slash with the number here means 12 bits of data is into the flash, and that tells the location of the memory. And the output is the actual uh, data. So only and you have 12 bits coming out. So this is a 12-bit uh, instruction. And you can see up here on your chart, the baseline parts have a 12-bit instruction size. So that's where that comes from, 12-bit. So that's the 12 bits there. Now, this is not really referred to as a 12-bit processor. It's referred to as an 8-bit processor. And when people refer to processors, they're usually talking about the data bus, the uh, and not the instruction bus. So the instruction, the uh, data bus over here is 8 bits. You can see the slash 8. You have this is the RAM address, and then this is the data. So the address points to a certain memory location, and that gets output onto the or input to the data bus, either one. So notice you have an input here, but it's also an output. So the data can come out or in. Uh, and then the data bus can come into the program counter, and the data bus can go into the this uh, file select register, status register, a, um, the W register, and the timer. So that's all, and then the general purpose I.O. So those are all the different places that the data uh, bus can go to. <coughs> Notice also that the, um, just follow the path from the program memory, the instructions reside in the program memory. So the, the instructions are the software that you program in the chip reside in the flash. They go through the instruction register. Um, eight bits of that can go to the ALU. Another five bits of that can go to the address mux and go to the the RAM. So it get these first these five bits can be actually direct addressing for your your data memory. Okay, and then the other five uh, the other five uh, bits. 5 to 7 can be an indirect address can come from your file select register. So that can be preloaded from your data. And that may sound confusing right now, but it all makes sense later as we, as we go through each one of these things individually. Again, this is just an overview. <clears throat> now, notice that uh, this chip only has two onboard peripherals. Um, it has a timer, timer 0. Okay, and then it has a general purpose input output port. So those are the only two peripherals on this. It has no analog to digital converter or anything like that. Uh, has no sort of CAN bus or UART or anything like that. 
So this is just a very simple chip. Also to the left here you see that we have a power and ground pin, we have a master clear. Um, these two functions, there's three different functions. There's a power on reset, so this power on reset monitors the power in the chip and will reset if the power is too low. Also has a watchdog timer which we'll talk about later and a device reset timer. Also there's circuitry on the chip to, per, to generate, some, sometimes it depends on the chip, an internal oscillator or sometimes you need to connect an external uh, crystal in order to get the oscillation working. So those are some things you need to make sure you to have if you're debugging or have problems with your chip. You have to make sure the power and the, the clocks are all good and working before any of your chip works. Okay, so this section needs to be working. So as a summary for chapter one, an embedded system is a product that, that has one or more computers embedded within it which exercise primarily as a control function. The embedded computer is usually a microcontroller. A microprocessor adapted for embedded control applications. Microcontrollers are designed uh, microcontrollers are designed according to accepted electronic and computer principles and are finally made up of microprocessor core, memory, and peripherals. It is important to be able to recognize their principal features. Microchip has a wide range of microcontrollers divided into a number of different families. Each family has identical or similar central architecture instruction set. However, common features also appear across all their microcontrollers. And knowledge of one family can lead to with ease to knowledge of another. So one thing we're going to you need to know for the course is you may learn or use you may learn about one family of processors in in the book and we may use a different part number. It doesn't really matter. Uh, as long as the part number is in the same family of processors we're talking about, it doesn't really matter because the instruction set is going to be the same. So don't get caught up on if we're talking about one type of, of chip with a certain part number, don't get caught up if, you, if we're working with one uh, in a project that has a slightly different part number. It doesn't really matter as long as they're in the same family. You're still going to be able to program them in the exact same way. Uh, minus the peripherals or the memory may be, memory size may be a little bit different you may have peripherals that are different, but other than that, everything else will be exactly the same. For the microchip 12F508 is a good microcontroller to introduce a range of features of microcontrollers in general and of PIC microcontrollers in particular. So, thanks for watching this video series and uh, the next section will be chapter 5. Thank you very much.